Hello, I'm Raggy Oman. This is Witness. Is the purpose of prison to rehabilitate offenders or to punish them? It's an age-old question which is being asked increasingly in the United States, where over the last 25 years, the number of people incarcerated has quadrupled. There are now more than 2 million inmates in US prisons, many of them serving extremely long sentences that offer little opportunity for parole. The situation is the result of a nationwide get tough attitude on crime, leading to the rise of lengthy, mandatory sentences. But longer sentences with less chance of parole has created a new reality in prison, death, by diseases associated with old age. A new prison culture has evolved to deal with elderly inmates who will never leave prison alive. Filmmaker John Goheen went to Angola Penitentiary in the state of Louisiana. It used to be one of the most violent prisons in the U.S. Today, it's a place where prison administrators and inmates work together to provide a measure of dignity for the increasing number of men for whom life in prison means death behind bars. I came to Angola first, 1979. This was a terrible place. It was a bloody and brutal place. It was known as the bloodiest prison in America. Angola, where the state of Louisiana's most violent criminals were confined in hellish conditions, where there were 10,000 sanctioned inmate floggings in a 12-year period, where prisoners fashioned crude but deadly weapons to use on guards and each other. In Angola's most turbulent times, a murder a month was considered normal. Today, the cell block where there were daily stabbings and beatings is a museum, and Angola is a different place. This place isn't as violent as it was, but it's still a prison. Over the last decade, there have been only four inmate murders at Angola but prisoners are still dying here, around 30 every year, and rising. Hello, young man. How are we doing? <laughs> doing all right? Pastor Sidney Deloche uh, tends to a dying congregation. Good, good, good. You been doing all right? A prison hospital ward filled with sick and aging inmates. 85% of the people here are perishing here. That's why my job is so special as a pastor as a Christian, as a preacher. How long you been locked up now? Well, this be four years. Yeah. I work with the old people every day. Sometimes they need a word of encouragement. Sometimes they need just an ear to listen to them. And then sometimes they need someone just to talk to. In the 1980s and 90s, a get tough on crime movement swept America. In many states, new mandatory sentencing laws sent criminals away for longer periods, even for nonviolent offenses. The result? A national prison population that went from 500,000 in 1980 to more than 2 million today. Fewer offenders are being released on parole, and the country's prisons are being transformed into geriatric centers, where even the dying are deemed too dangerous too guilty to release. There are men that should be here, but then on the other hand, there are so many people that need to be delivered from this place and make room for others who need to be here, you know. Pastor Deloche says one of those people deserving deliverance from Angola is him. I was on the charge of aggravated rape. I'm a first offender. It don't take but one mistake. I, you know, all night party and, and Woke up the next morning, police putting handcuffs on me. How you doing, Jim? Hey, Amen. Sidney Deloche has spent half his life as a prisoner at Angola. It was here that he discovered his faith, that he began studying with a prison chaplain and taking correspondence courses, finally becoming an ordained minister with a mission to preach the gospel to his fellow inmates. I started teaching the Bible class in 1982. In 1990, I became pastor of that very fellowship, and I've been pastoring ever since. 
There may be no place in Angola more in need of spiritual comfort than here. Yes, those three rooms over on that side are designated priority hospice rooms. Part of Angola's hospital facility is set aside for inmates suffering from terminal illnesses. They are brought here from small prison cells to live out the rest of their days in relative comfort. I have terminal stage four lung cancer. And uh, it was a blessing to, to see that they had somebody that really cared. The volunteers and the staff is great. Not that long ago, hospice programs like this were unheard of in American prisons. Angola's began with the 1995 arrival of a new warden who had new ideas. If it had not been for a man such as Warden Kane, you know, he came in and he established a hospice program. Where else can dying men, dying men don't get this kind of treatment on the outside. The, the thing just fell in place, all the blocks fell in place, and I was not smart enough to plan it. And I didn't figure it out, it just happened. We need to deal with this death and dying issue. Could it happen to us? Well, the kind of inmates we have, you know, we bury more than we release out the front gate. 90% of them are gonna die here. Everyone calls Ted Durbin animal. I got in a fight in a bar one night and uh, I was in, the, well, in the process of losing this fight. Uh, I bit a guy's nose off. Um, and they gave me a nickname Animal. That bite took a big chunk out of Ted's life, too. He spent the last 18 years in Angola. These days, Animal atones for his violent past by volunteering in the one place where no one has the strength to be violent anymore, the hospice. Some people have problems. Him having lung cancer, he still smokes. You know, he's been smoking probably, what, 40 years now? 40 years. And, uh, I make sure that if he runs out of cigarettes, he's got some. You think of these colors, what do they mean? Uh, Inmates yellow. are a crucial component of the hospice program. More than 500 of them in Angola have been trained to perform CPR. For other duties, the only requirement is compassion. What if you have one that's, that's a paralytic? A paralytic, I have to bathe him, uh, feed him. You know, change the doctor, if so be. In my aspect of it, what I do sitting with these patients and being with them when they die, I'm actually there. My best friend took his last breath in this institution. Uh, and then you see all them guys up there, it's like, man, I'm gonna be busy. I've always built them the same. I designed it and I stuck with it. It's my design. For decades, the prison carpentry shop made mostly furniture. Now, Richard Leggett earns an inmate's top wages, 20 cents an hour, seven years creating ago. caskets. About seven years ago we started these. Warden Kane come to us and ask us if we would make them because the caskets that they were getting from the streets weren't about much. Styrofoam and packing crates and what have you. Leggett tries to make sure he always has at least three caskets in stock. The hospital pretty well keeps me apprised of what, who, they're, who they're watching or what have you, you know. Try to let me know in advance when I gotta have one. Sometimes Richard Leggett has had plenty of time to perfect his craft. I've been here 35 years, murder. Despite his life sentence, despite the virtual impossibility of parole, Richard Leggett says he and almost everyone else in Angola cling to the thought of eventual release. I actually believed I was going to get right out of here. As do most people that come in here. Through the courts or something. But it doesn't happen. That means that most of the inmates here will eventually rest in one of Richard Leggett's caskets. Well, we upholster it with, with bed, uh, bed quilting. We take the bed quilting and we cover, we cover the wood with it. We put a foam mattress in the bottom of it. Then we put a lace border around it. And 
we used to ferry the guys, the only thing we had were package crates that the coffins come in or the flimsy coffin. And we were carrying a guy to the, to the grave site and he fell out of the bottom of the, gra of the package crate and Warden Kane said, oh no, that's the end of that. And during that time, I remember that he caught some heat from uh, political people out there and mainly from victim rights organizations saying, you know, well, my, my loved one was killed and they didn't have as nice a funeral as that. And Morgan Kane's reply was, well, you know what? Once a guy dies, he's finished his sentence. And it's only right of us to be dignified about the process. Many of the guys that are here don't have family. And those that do have family are poor and unable to come up with five and $6,000 to, to bury somebody who's been locked away 25, 30, 40 years. We're allowed to just bury men with dignity and respect. We have a service in the chapel, and we go and we have a graveside where we de service where we deposit the body. In the Angola Prison Cemetery, headstones once carried no names, just numbers. Now, the system recognizes that having paid for their crimes, prisoners deserve some small acknowledgement of their passing, some permanent memorial to their existence. Just because you're behind prison bars doesn't mean you're animals, you know, doesn't, doesn't mean you, 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 you're crazy men, you know. You're still human. You still have some self-worth. When Witness returns, the unique and somber spectacle of a funeral behind bars.